How's it going, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome as we go back in time in the WWE and relive it right here on Blast from the Past on No Holds Barred Wrestling Podcast, your Canadian WWE podcast that reviews, discusses, and reacts to the WWE and No Holds Barred on anything we say, pun intended. I am your host, the self-proclaimed greatest host of Blast from the past kyle masters and you can follow me on twitter at real kyle masters for all blast from the past updates and episode notifications you can follow the podcast itself on twitter at no holds barred wp we're also available on facebook and instagram by searching up no holds barred wp you can listen to all episodes of the podcast and other content such as our lowdown show is our weekly raw and smackdown review and other stuff on youtube.com slash nhbwr we are also available on spreaker.com slash nhbwp and itunes and stitcher so go check us out wherever is easier and for you that's easy to convenient for you to listen to us i don't know if i got that out right <laughs> anyways guys um it's the introduction of a new show and that's called Blast from the Past. We did have something similar in the past, uh, Blast from the Past. Basically, we kind of like relived certain pay-per-views that were going on, and we talked about their, uh, some moments from them. But I'm revamping it, and uh, basically how this is going to go down is we're going to start in the year 2000. So when we start in the year 2000, we're going to start at Royal Rumble 2000, and we're going to re- uh, review, or I'm going to review and react to each pay-per-view leading up from that so after Royal Rumble 2000 move on to no way out 2000 and so on and so forth and basically just like kind of give you an overview of what was going on at the time uh, what the pay-per-view was like what was the main event and uh you know stuff like that so that's what uh, i had an idea for this episode basically kind of like a retro episode of uh the sunday night heat almost but uh that's what this is going to be out and that's what's blast from the past um we are going to be starting at Royal Rumble 2000 and uh basically what was going on in the 2000s and i guess the wrestling world you can say uh, at the time, WCW was kind of fading away. This was uh, almost during the 2001 Time Warner AOL murder. So there was uh, rumors going around at that time that that was going to happen. It was also during the the terrible Vince Russo era. And uh, as you can remember, David Arquette was even world champion at one time. So that kind of pretty much speaks for itself and how uh, WCW was fading away. So that company was starting to fade away. And it would eventually lead to Vince McMahon buying the company. Um Speaking of WWE, it was WWF still at the time. It was two years into the spark of the Attitude Era, which basically gave the edge to WWF over WCW uh, during the whole Monday Night Wars at that time. Also, a side company, if you guys remember, and you should remember, ECW was struggling at the time in the 2000s with pay-per-views being canceled a lot and a lot of talent leaving the company due to not being paid enough money and other companies promising them guaranteed contracts. So, a lot was happening during the 2000s all around this time, but we're going to follow just the WWF, and we're going to start at the Royal Rumble. And uh, this was quite a Royal Rumble to remember, if not a lot of you remember the uh, Royal Rumble 2000. Um, this is probably one of my favorite Royal Rumbles now looking back at it. And uh, there's actually pretty good uh, pretty good things happening in this. Uh, we had the debut of uh, Taz. We had a, the first ever tag team table match. Uh, we had the, the Miss Royal Rumble 2000 contest, which I'll get into when I get there. Um, China was Intercontinental Champion going into this pay-per-view. Uh, I guess, actually, I think she was co-owners with Chris Jericho. Um, and we had the... Probably one of the greatest street fights in WWE history between Triple H and Cactus Jack that happened at this uh, pay-per-view as well. And one of the most memorable uh, Raw Rumbles. Uh, we actually had a, w- a winner the crowd wanted. So, shocking, right? <laughs> it's not really what happens nowadays in WWE, but uh, a crazy Raw Rumble winner. We'll get to that when we talk about that. I won't reveal that yet if you guys don't haven't seen the Raw Rumble 2000 yet. So... That's going to be a blast from the past, guys, and we're just going to start Royal Rumble 2000. So let's get right into it. And uh, Royal Rumble 2000 started on January 23rd, 2000. It was in New York, so it was at Madison Square Garden. WWE champion was tri- or WWF champion was Triple H. The WWF Intercontinental Champion was shared by China and Chris Jericho. And the WWF Tag Team Champions were the New Age Outlaws and Road Dogg and Billy Gum, who were still members of D-Generation X at the time. Uh, the opening contest was Kurt Angle versus a mystery opponent. So a lot of people were, uh, I guess, that getting rumors and uh, getting, I guess, uh, inside sources back then was a lot harder 
than it is today with the internet being what it is nowadays. But uh, a lot of uh, sources leaked out that Taz was coming up to the WWE from ECW after leaving ECW. And a lot of people were guessing that it was going to be Kurt Angle's mystery opponent. So uh, as for Kurt Angle, he made his debut earlier in the year back in November of 1999, so a couple months before this. He started to develop a winning streak but wasn't really getting over with the crowd, even being portrayed as an American hero gimmick. The crowd was just not buying into it, and he's basically getting a heel reaction every time he would come out. Um, this would eventually lead to the opening contest of the pay-per-view where Angle came out and started to talk about his uh, three eyes. If you guys remember the three eyes with Kurt Angle, uh, integrity, intelligence, and... Uh, Oh my god, <laughs> I'm lacking that second one right now. It's integrity, intelligence. Oh man, I'm botching already. Look at me. <laughs> uh, I'm just going to Google it right now on while I record this. The, his three eyes. Oh man, I can't believe it. I don't remember. I always forget. You know, it's not really my fault. A lot of people forget the, the three eyes when it comes to Kurt Angle. And I always remember integrity and intelligence. Um, oh, it's intensity. That's it. It's intensity. God. I gotta be more intense with knowing my knowledge about this. I'll, I'll get better for the next episode, guys. But he was talking about his three eyes, and then he basically was talking about his mystery opponent. Eventually, it made the heartbeat sound as Taz's theme music hit, and the crowd went absolutely bonkers in New York as Taz is from, uh, or being billed at from the Red Light District of New York. Um, very, very good pop. Uh, lots of ECW chants at that time for this as well. Um, really good match, uh, even though it was very quick, it was 3 minutes and 15 seconds long, it was a very quick match, but it, it was a good showcase match for Taz, I, I, I would think, um, I know a lot of people in New York knew about Taz and knew what he was about from that crowd being heavy ECW fans, um, but it was good for the people that never really followed ECW to get a good sense of what Taz is and how big of a monster the WWF wanted him at the time, and, uh, Kurt Angle was being, and Kurt Angle got choked out, and it was being handed his first loss in the WWF. This was Kurt Angle's first loss in the couple of months from his debut. So, thanks to Taz, Kurt Angle was no longer undefeated. I think this was an unreal debut for Taz, and to get the crowd hyped for the pay-per-view, I think it was a really good way to, to start the pay-per-view. So, I thought this was really cool, and actually a smart idea for uh, Kurt Angle to lose a streak to someone like Taz. And uh, Taz would eventually uh, go on to be, I think, I think he won the Hardcore Championship, and maybe I think he won the Intercontinental Championship, but he ended up being a really good mid-carder and uh, eventually fade away, and we know what happened. He went into the commentary uh, team. Um, I think actually it was due to injury. Uh, so next we had the first ever WWF Tag Team Tables match for the WWF Tag, or not for the Tag Team Championships, I'm sorry. Um, it was just the first ever WWF Tag Team Tables match. I, I can't believe this wasn't for the titles, this would have been sick. It was the Hardy Boys versus the Dudleys. Apparently this was the first ever uh, table match though. I pff, I was like, really? In the WWF this is the first ever Tag Team Table match. Um, and what <laughs> what teams did debut it too? The Hardys and the Dudleys. Uh, both teams were in a current feud with each other going uh, all the way back from their WrestleMania match at WrestleMania 18 and 17. Um, this was a very, very, very physical match at Royal Rumble. Um, lots of surefire table spots. Uh, but teammates helping each other by moving the tables out of the way. So they, it was definitely looking like it was going to be a table spot. But the uh, the other person's teammate would help by moving the tables out of the way. And um, I'm pretty sure this, <laughs> this is basically a hardcore match. Because there's a lot of other weapons being used here. Like chairs. And eventually a ladder was even being used in this match. So this was very, very, very physical. And uh, there are, a lot, there are cra crazy table spots ensued after this. With people going through tables but not losing the match. You know, like missing or getting pushed into a table. You know, basically not uh, not causing them to lose the match. Uh, eventually the Dudley set up a table in the entranceway. Which was uh, the MSG one, if you guys remember. It's just that little one. Um, if you know the arena really well, if not, go back and look at it. it uh, they did a double stack table formation with Matt Hardy set up on the top of it. Bubba and Jeff Hardy were at the top of the entrance balcony. Uh, Jeff eventually low blowed Bubba, and when Matt moved out of the way of the double tables, Bubba basically got pushed and fell through all the tables, man. Crazy spot here. Um... Matt set up another table in the ring and placed Diva on it where Jeff Hardy got up to the turnbuckle and Swanton off the balcony. Uh, sorry, so this was not in the ring. This was in the entranceway. I thought it was in the ring. So after Bubba went through both tables, they were, <laughs> Jeff was able 
to set himself up, and Matt was able to get off and move stuff out of the way to set a table up right where Bubba Ray fell and put Devon on top for Jeff Hardy to swanton down and get the win for the Hardys. So the Hardys won the first ever tag team table match in the WWE. That's crazy. Um... But this is a really, really physical match. I really enjoyed it, man. I love the Attitude Era. I think a lot of you got there love the Attitude Era, too, if you were part of it. And if you guys haven't, go back and watch it. A lot of crazy shit happened back in the day with the Attitude Era, especially this match. This is crazy, man. The, the Dudleys and the Hardys and Edge and Christian had one of the most epic tag team feuds and matches I've ever seen. And it, it's going to be so hard to top it with now in the WWE, so... It was crazy. I love this match. So the Hardys winning over the Dudleys. Uh, next, <laughs> we had a cringe thing. I can't believe I watched it. I had to watch it just for the <laughs> the review itself. But the Mist Royal Rumble 2000 contest. Oh, boy. This was cringe. The contestants were Ivory, Terry, Jacqueline, Barbara Bush, Luna Vachon, and The Cat. While the, just, the judges consisted of uh, comedian Andy Richter. And WWF alumni Sergeant Slaughter, Tony Gurria, Johnny Valant, Freddie Blasey, and the fabulous Moolah. <laughs> what? Right there, you can just tell. This is just cringe. Like, what the hell am I even watching here? The contestants showed their swimsuits. I mean, some of them, you know, they look pretty good in swimsuits. I'm not going to lie. Uh, though Luna refused to take off her coat as the judges were deciding Mae Young appeared. So Mae Young comes out of nowhere, and we all know who Mae Young is, if you don't go back and look, and her announced her participation in the contest. Oh, man. After showing her swim shoot, she flashed her breasts! <laughs> and it was censored before Mark Henry covered her up. Mark Henry was up. This is the, the whole Mark Henry and Mae Young storyline. And the judges then unanimously decided that Mae Young wins this contest. Oh, Jesus Christ, oh my god. See, back then, there was still cringe here and there, and this was definitely a big part of it. I need to see Mae Young's tits. That was just... Alright, All right, I gotta move on from that, guys. <laughs> uh, next, we had a triple threat match for the Intercontinental Championship. Chris Jericho versus Hardcore Holly versus China. Uh, so this match was billed as Chris Jericho in China as co-holders of the Intercontinental Championship, even though the records say that China was a champion. Uh, this happened due to the following. This is why they are billed as co-champions. Chris Jericho defended the titles against her in a rematch on December 30th edition of SmackDown before the Royal Rumble. Both competitors' shoulders were down on the mat. As a result, both of them were pinned. On the January 3rd, 2000 edition of Raw is War, Stephanie McMahon ruled that both Jericho and China were co-holders of the title and announced that only one of them could defend the title at a time, but if any one of them lost the title, both of them would lose the title. It's interesting. And on January 20th, 2000 edition of SmackDown, it was announced that China, Chris Jericho, and Hardcore Holly would wrestle in a triple threat match to determine the sole holder of the Intercontinental Championship, which is right here at the Royal Rumble. So into the match we go at the Royal Rumble. I actually enjoyed this match. I actually enjoyed it. Um, it's a very, very good triple threat match. Very underrated in my opinion. There's a lot of good spots, a lot of near falls, and I think it had a decent ending. Uh, the ending basically uh, went off like this. China looked like she was going to pull it off. With uh, hitting Hardcore Holly with the pedigree, and then a suplex or superplex, and then a chair shot to the head. So all three of those things leading to uh, her applying the Boston Crab to Hardcore Holly, and they sure fired a submission win. But while she's performing it, Jericho took advantage of this and bulldog China, and then hit her with the lion salt, and that's how he won. He won with the lion salt on China, and your new sole Intercontinental Champion winner, Chris Jericho, one of his many Intercontinental Championships that he has in his career. So I really, really like this match, and as you can tell, and as you can hear, if you haven't seen it, this is actually a really good match. I suggest you go back and watch it if you really want to see a good triple threat match um especially like china like wrestling with the men that's crazy right um back then i mean a lot of people just saw china as one of the men because of how butchy she was but i mean that's a great accomplishment from china man um i really like this match again a lot of good spots a lot of good near falls um and a good way for Jericho to win it there. I loved it. And basically kind of... It's almost like burying China, I guess. I mean, China should have won this match. Basically what she did to Hardcore Holly. But Jericho being the uh, opportunist in this case. And uh, capitalizing it on it. And uh, winning the Intercontinental Championship from uh, China and Hardcore Holly. Being the sole champion. Uh, we moved on to the WWF Tag Team Championships. New Age Outlaws versus the Alkalites. 
So it was Road Dogg and Billy Gunn versus Farouk and Bradshaw. Yes, JBL was partnered with Farouk, who is Ron Simmons, and they were called the Acolytes. Uh, before the match, the uh, New Age Outlaws gave their signature speech. If you don't remember it, guys, if you don't know it, go back and check it. They always used to do a speech before, kind of like a DX thing before their uh, their matches. Really cool. I love their speech. It's iconic with WWE. Um, the Outlaws came running to the ring, like basically crashing it to gain the early advantage on the New Age Outlaws. The The match was all right. It was nothing too special in, in my my books. Um New Age Outlaws were still part of the DX, which led to the interference of X-Pac near the end of the match. Uh, he gave a spinning heel kick to Bradshaw, and Billy Gunn gave him the Famouser for the win. And the New Age Outlaws retained the WWF Tag Team titles at this point. To me, it didn't really feel like a pay-per-view match. It kind of uh, like a raw. It kind of felt like a raw tag team title match, like something that would happen on a raw episode. It just it felt kind of too rushed, in my opinion. It, it didn't last that long. I think it was only six to eight minutes long. Um, but I don't know, it was all right. It was okay, but it wasn't, again, not pay-per-view quality in my opinion. Um, it, again, it felt a little rushed. So I think they could have done a better job, but it was all right. I'll give it a, a decent rating in uh, in that for the... But I think they could have done a better job, especially for the WF Tag Team titles. So we're going to move on here to the WF Championship. And it was a street fight between Triple H and Cactus Jack, who is Mick Foley, one of his personas. Definitely one of the most physical feuds of the ongoing Attitude Era. Uh, throughout this feud, Triple H and Cactus Jack have beaten the absolute hell out of each other. You can definitely see it in the promo video for this match if you go back and watch it. Uh, definitely something we haven't seen in the current RB for a long time now. Uh, Mick Foley was trying to become a four-time WWF champion. He already won it three times at that point. Uh, and the match did live up to its expectations. This was very, very physical. Uh, this is what a street fight should be nowadays in WWE, I think. I know they like to do this whole no-holds-barred thing or, or no DQ. I think if they ever have another street fight in the current WWE era, they need to do look at this and be like, okay, we need to get as hardcore as this. In my opinion, you don't have to bleed, but get a, as much hardcore as they did in this match. There were so many different weapons used in this match as well. Now, I, I feel like nowadays, the, the no-holds-bar match in Utica, they kind of just stick to chairs and the, and the steel steps. The occasional table comes out. They, just, they don't use a lot of weapons in my books. Um, there are so many different weapons used in this match. It was crazy. There was even a spot where Cactus Jacks or Cactus Jack suplexed Triple H onto a wooden skid in the aisle way, man. If you don't know what wooden skid is, Google it on images really quickly. And that's what Triple H landed on. Like, it was, you, the, the, the boards broke underneath Triple H, man. This was an incredible spot and uh, very street uh, street fight-like. Eventually, Cactus Jack brought out Barbie. If you don't know what Barbie is, it is a wooden 2x4 wrapped in barbed wire. Sometimes a baseball bat wrapped in barbed wire. But, like always, it fails at first. Every time I've seen Cactus Jack pull it out, he always fails on the first try. HHH, or Triple H gets his hands on it. And smacks him in the stomach and the back with him. And that hurts. A lot of people are like, oh, man, you must have not hit him hard. Go back and look how Triple H swings this, man. He hits him hard with that 2x4. And that's got to hurt, man. Those spikes on uh, on uh, on the the barbed wire, man, don't give too much. And then he gets... Uh, and then we got a low bow with with uh, Barbie on Triple H. So Cactus Jack eventually reverses it and gets a low blow on Triple H. Not the not the barbed wire and the, the the handle end, thank God. And uh, Cactus Jack just unloads on Triple H at this point. Multiple shots to the head with to Triple H with Barbie too. Triple H was like the king of taking head shots back then too, man. He took him and sold him so well. Uh, even we got an elbow drop with uh, Cactus Jack holding it right on a Triple H, and then Cactus Jack even bulldogging Triple H's head onto Barbie. Man, so many crazy spots this match. I loved it, man. I love hardcore matches. They're always my favorite to watch. I know there's not a lot of people's cup of tea out there, but they are great. Uh, eventually, Triple H gets uh, his hand on a pair of handcuffs and handcuffs Cactus Jack. And then beats the absolute shit out of him with a chair. Multiple headshots. Shots to the back. And they're out in the entranceway. And then out comes The Rock to save his best friend, Cactus Jack. And just smacks Triple H in the head with the freaking chair, man. Oh my god, that chair shot was insane. And then, oh my god, Cactus Jack brings out the most inhumane thing he is known today out to be bringing out in these type of matches. 
And if you guys already know, you know what I'm about to say. If you don't know, he brings out a bag full of thumbtacks. Yes, it sounds, <laughs> it does sound less cringe than the, the barbed wire bat, but come on, man, thumbtacks are another world. Especially at this point in the match, your body is already aching from a street fight. Uh, Cactus Jack tries to charge at Triple H in front of the uh, all the placed thumbtacks in the ring, but Triple H reverses it into a backflip, and Cactus Jack lands back first on all the freaking thumbtacks, man. Oh, man, I cringe every time I see a spot like that. It's ugh, I get the shivers. And, oh, my God, but Triple H ain't done, man. He ain't done. He tries to beat him with a pedigree, and Cactus Jack kicks right out of it. Right out of the pedigree. So Triple H is getting flustered at this point going, all right, I know what to do. And oh my God, the spot we got next gives me the the chills and the, the shivers every single time I watch it. If you haven't watched it, I, uh, I warn you before watching this. Triple H sets up in the pedigree right over the tax with Cactus Jack. And pedigrees him right on to the tax. Yes. And if you don't think this is real and he thought he protected himself, you wait till he flips him over. And you look at Cactus Jack's head. He's got thumbtacks all the way around his eye on his forehead into his freaking head, man. Oh, my God. This is a brutal spot. And that's how Triple H won. And rightfully so. You should win after that. You shouldn't have to kick out after that. If you kick out after that, you're a god. You're like Roman Reigns. Like, I was insane. And that's how Triple H retains the WWF Championship. Um, after the match, Triple H is just so in pain, he gets carried out in a stretcher, but I guess Cactus Jack is already in the back, but he comes back out and rolls Triple H all the way back into the ring, like he throws him off the stretcher, puts him in the ring, and then beats the shit out of him in the ring with Barbie as the crowd is just applauding Cactus Jack for coming back and giving him a standing ovation, ECW chance happening, and I think this is a really cool ending, even though Triple H won the match, it's a really good ending, what they did afterward, a good spot, to have the crowd still happy. So this is what you gotta do. To, to you gotta, you can have your heels or your guys that you want to win, but then you can do other stuff to, to make the crowd happy in the end. So I thought this was an insane match, man. Very, very, very physical match, as you can, uh, as you just heard. And if you want to go back and watch it, I do, I do warn you if you if you cringe at this sort of stuff, I do warn you how physical this match is. And if you're all for that, man, go see it. It's probably one of the most hardcore matches I've ever seen in the WWE. That's for sure. So let's get right to the main event, and that is the Royal Rumble match. Yes, this is back when Royal Rumble was the main event of the shows. Um, this is an interesting Royal Rumble this year. Very, very interesting after watching this match. Uh, our boy D'Lo Brown, the, uh, <laughs> the guy we based our lowdown show off of, uh, opened up the match. He was the first contestant. He, uh, he was the first... Uh, Guy in the ring with uh, Grandmaster Sexe, which is, uh, I think J it's Jerry Lawler's son. And part of the too cool uh, tag team combination with Sky Too Hottie. Uh, this, rumble, this is the rumble where we had too cool actually dance in the ring when Rikishi made his entrance. And Sky Too Hottie and Grandmaster Sexe were also in the ring. But after they were done doing their too cool dance, Rikishi ended up throwing both of them over the rope. And eliminating both of them. It was hilarious. I actually had a good time watching this rumble. I, I loved it. Um, there was the one, uh, the two guys, Funaki, and I think it was Taka Mishinoku. They kept apparent jumping in the ring at random times and attacking people even after being eliminated. Um, that was the same with the Mean Street Posse. They kind of had a thing with Farouk and Bradshaw and attacked both of them, which helped uh, the big boss man eliminate both of them while the Mean Street Posse were not even in the match itself. So there's some... Uh, Things going on in between during this whole Royal Rumble match. A lot of uh, crazy entrances. A lot of people I forgot about that were even in WWF at the time. Um, I really enjoyed it. It came down to the final four people of the Royal Rumble where The Rock, Big Show, Kane, and X-Pac were left. Um, even after a couple of spots with Kane and X-Pac, it looked like, man, Kane looked dominant at this point. Man, I thought Kane was actually going to win it. Um, I knew he was going to win, but uh, at this point, I, I'm like, man, Kane probably could have been the winner here. He was, he was doing good. But eventually came down to just Big Show and The Rock. The crowd is very heavy behind The Rock and booing the hell out of The Big Show. The Rock hits the people's elbow and then tries to throw The Big Show out, but it backfires and he gets choke slammed by The Big Show. Big Show then picks up The Rock and he's like signaling to the crowd like Babe Ruth style, where am I going to throw him out? Where am I going to power slam his gun? He's pointing, he's pointing, he points at one end. He's like, all right. So he charges towards that rope. But as he's throwing him out, The Rock hangs on The Big Show and flips him over The Rock. And then The Big Show lands on the floor. And this is very controversial. There's not a lot of camera angles back then. 
but a lot of people say that The Rock's feet might have hit the floor first, but apparently The Rock was hanging onto the top rope so hard that his feet did not hit the rope, and The Rock wins the Royal Rumble match in the big show, losing by going right over The Rock, and The Rock going on to WrestleMania of that year. And The Rock went again. The crowd went absolutely ballistic at this point. So, yeah, Royal Rumble winner. The, the crowd and the people in the WWF actually wanted to happen. Crazy to think that. But uh, this is a really, really good Royal Rumble match. I really enjoyed it. And what a way to end it, man. I, I thought that was a really good, uh, well-done way to end it. And uh, we saw what happened. If you guys know that what happens in the year 2000 at WrestleMania and what happens with The Rock and his uh, Royal Rumble match. Uh, Basically, his Royal Rumble number one contendership. We'll get into that when we get there. But, uh, yeah, the Rock Wing, the Royal Rumble. Really, really good reaction. And overall, I thought this was actually a really good pay per view. Definitely the start. Uh, basically, uh, definitely you can tell it's the start to the road to WrestleMania at, at this point, man. So many crazy things happening. Um, the next pay per view will be No Way Out 2000. And uh, interesting stuff happens at that pay per view as well on the way to WrestleMania. But. I really enjoyed the Royal Rumble 2000 from start to finish. Uh, I think the only uh, thing I could say, <laughs> the cringe Miss Rumble 2000, we could have probably done without that. And they probably could have made the WWF Tag Team Titles match a little bit better. But overall, I thought it was a good pay-per-view. And I'm going to give uh, every pay-per-view, guys, I'm going to do in Blast from the Past, I'm going to give it only a score out of 5. So out of 5, I'm giving uh, the Royal Rumble 2000 4 out of 5 for sure. On uh, the first rating here on Blast from the Past. So, Royal Rumble 2000 gets a 4 out of 5 in my books for sure. And uh, next episode we'll be talking about is No Way Out 2000. Some very, very interesting things happen on the way to this pay-per-view, guys. And happen at this pay-per-view. So, stay tuned for that. That's going to do it for the first episode, guys. I hope you really enjoyed this. Hit that like button on YouTube if you guys did. And share it. Please retweet it. I'll have it tweeted out with the real Kyle Masters account. And get the word out there. I've been doing a lot more of these. So, yeah, next episode will be No Way Out 2000. Look for that next week. Other than that, guys, I think that's going to do it. Yeah, that's all I'm going to be covered. So, that's going to do it here for Blast from the Past, Episode 1, Royal Rumble 2000. Um, right here on No Holds Barred Wrestling Podcast, your Canadian WWE podcast that reviews, discusses, and reacts to the WWE and No Holds Barred on anything we say, pun intended. Um, I am your host, the self-proclaimed greatest host, Kyle Masters. You can follow me on Twitter at RealKyleMasters for all Blast from the Past updates and episode notifications. You can also follow the podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram by searching up No Holds Barred WP. We're also available on YouTube, youtube.com slash NHBWR, so go give us a subscribe. And we are also available on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and Spreaker, so go give us a five-star rating and follow those as well. That's going to wrap it up, guys. See you next episode.